Please pray with me. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Watch your mouth, my mother said. If you speak like that again, I'm going to wash it out with soap. Nevertheless, Round about age 13, I persisted. Now, I had been used to the smell of ivory soap for most of my childhood. But the taste is very difficult to get out of your mouth. It was a very good deterrent at the time, reserved mostly for curse words, which were prohibited in my household growing up. And while I can't say that parental opposition to cursing really stuck, I will say that the need to watch your mouth has never left me. The writer of James believed that what comes out of our mouths can heal and can wound, and that has certainly been my experience in the church. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never harm me is one of the biggest lies ever perpetrated to children, and we should know this as people of the book. God speaks the world into being. Jesus is the Word made flesh. Words are at the heart of our life together as a people. Words also initiate wars legitimize violence, stoke hatred and division. What we say matters deeply. James says that out of the same mouth come blessings and curses, but I don't think that we should take this to mean that some of us always speak one or the other. More often than not, I see blessings and curses intertwined with one another, tangled up in ways that require critical reflection. I'm sure that, like many of you, I have been reflecting on 20 years since 9-11. Since I was ordained on September 23rd, 2001, not quite two weeks after that dreaded day, my entire ordained ministry has taken place in the shadow of war. What has struck me about American leadership during all that time is the way in which truth is so often intermixed, intertwined with misinformation and untruth. President Bush spoke to the nation from the pulpit of the National Cathedral on September 14th, 2001. His speech and the entire worship service that day were a mixture of spiritual guidance sorely needed as Americans grieved and political positioning toward retaliation and eventual war. It was a dangerous mix. Yet I remember how difficult it was at the time, I'm sure many of you remember as well, to offer anything like critical reflection as we all sought unity in grief and the hope that the world really could come together for a different kind of peace. So perhaps it's more important to reflect 20 years later on how those words strike us today. On that day, September 14th, President Bush named a lot of things that were absolutely true in my opinion. We come before God to pray for the missing and the dead and for those who love them. On Tuesday, our country was attacked with deliberate and massive cruelty. We have seen the images of fire and ashes and bent steel. Now come the names, the list of casualties we are only beginning to read. They are the names of men and women who began their day at a desk or in an airport, busy with life. They are the names of people who face death and at their last moments called home to say, be brave and I love you. 
They are the names of passengers who defied their murderers and prevented the murder of others on the ground. They are the names of men and women who wore the uniform of the United States and died at their posts. They are the names of rescuers, the ones whom death found running up the stairs and into the fires to help others. We will read all these names, the president said. We will linger over them and learn their stories stories and many Americans will weep. And we did. Everything the president said to that point in the speech was true. The massive grief, the deliberate cruelty of those terrible terrorist attacks, the heroism and love shown by so many fellow citizens on that day. And then came misleading words that demand our reflection. Just three days removed from these events, Americans do not yet have the distance of history, but our responsibility to history is already clear to answer these attacks and rid the world of evil. America charged with ridding the world of evil? That near religious zeal sounded almost as dangerous as the underlying ethics of the terrorists who flew into those towers. This nation is peaceful, the president went on, but fierce when stirred to anger. And yet when we are honest, we know from our own history that this nation has those who love peace and those who have lynched our fellow citizens. This nation has supported democratic movements across the globe and overthrown democratically elected governments in places where those governments didn't suit our economic interests. Our nation has supported freedom of speech and freedom to practice your religion and freedom of the press to write what they see. And our country has incarcerated more of its own citizens, disproportionately citizens of color, than most other nations in the world. We are sometimes peaceful and sometimes not. But again, before the president finished his speech, he uttered more truth. We see our national character in rescuers working past exhaustion, in long lines of blood donors, in thousands of citizens who have asked to work and serve in any way possible, all true. And we have seen our national character in eloquent acts of sacrifice. Inside the World Trade Center, one man who could have saved himself, staying until the end and at the side of his quadriplegic friend, true. A beloved priest died giving the last rites to a firefighter, true. Two office workers finding a disabled stranger carried her down 68 floors to safety, true. A group of men drove through the night from Dallas to Washington to bring skin grass for burned victims, all true. And then more bending of the truth. America is a nation full of good fortune with so much to be grateful for, but we are not spared from suffering. In every generation, the world has produced enemies of human freedom. They have attacked America because we are freedom's home and defender, and the commitment of our fathers is now the calling of our time. You know, no critic of American policy or power that I know has ever lashed out at America because, quote, we are freedom's home and defender. They have criticized or protested or turned to illegitimate violence because we are sometimes the world's bully, reaping what we did not sow, overpromising what miracles our military might achieve, refusing to face the truth of our own history in all of its valor and victimization with a kind of humility and heart for the truth. It seems to me that we will only ever get to the root of our problems by being honest about our history alongside the truth of the heroism that we saw displayed in the days, months, and years after 9-11. What comes out of our mouths 
is more important than ever. Unfortunately, we can all be as dualistic in our language as some of the people that we oppose. So I hear things like capitalism or every single Republican idea or entire states in the nation characterized as all bad. Our imprecision is its own kind of lying and it makes any kind of relationship with anyone that we name as enemy impossible, which is what the war machine achieved at the beginning of the post 9-11 world and what we have been trying and struggling to overcome ever since. And yet if we are honest, about where we are right now in history, we will see there is no way to save the planet without working with people we've written off as enemies. There is no way to reshape our nation's racist policies without engaging people who don't currently see anti-racism in their direct interest. And apparently, we're now being told that there's no way to stop a terrorist organization in Afghanistan without working with the Taliban, our longtime enemy, which, if true, means that enemies can be very temporary things. William Sloan Coffin said that there are three kinds of patriots, two bad, one good. The bad are the uncritical lovers and the loveless critics the uncritical lovers, and the loveless critics. Good patriots, he told us, carry on a lover's quarrel with their country. Coffin reminds us that when we're talking about human beings, we can't afford to accept anything less than the love of neighbor that recognizes the fullness of our mixed natures our penchant for blessings and curses wrapped up in one. I think this is what James saw early in the church in a small but important way long before the Christian faith got so tangled up with civil power. Watch your mouth, James admonished, because cursing anyone who is made in the image of God is condemning a gift from God. It is failing to acknowledge that every human being, no matter how misguided, no matter how filled with hate, no matter how wrong, is still made in God's image and therefore not to be written off completely by other human beings. Writing people off is the first step on the way to violence and as Dr. King tried to tell us so many times, violence creates more problems than it solves. We should never be surprised about this during or after a war. We should remember it always before we are drawn into them. Words matter. The good news is that we can practice that kind of communication in the community of the church, speaking words to one another that seek the truth in our assessment of the world and ourselves, disagreeing with one another in ways that honor the divine spark in each other, especially when we disagree, differentiating between words offered to wound and those that are shared out of honesty and a desire to create the possibility for healing for everyone, challenging each other to resist those dualistic impulses of our ongoing post-9-11 world, which makes some people out to be always good and others always bad, striving instead for our words to match our deepest conviction that all human beings are gifts from God. We can practice that kind of communication in the community of the church so that we can be ready to share it with the world, challenging that us versus them language that has grown like a cancer since 9-11 
challenging any language that seeks to make one group of human beings out to be less than children of God, challenging the words that we use to divide us from each other when we judge people we support by only their best traits and judge people we oppose only by their worst challenging the arrangements of the world that have grown out of those divisive words and limited what we can accomplish as one people sharing an earth that we did not create and is not ours to own. And even when that kind of practice within a community doesn't make it deep into our world, still it matters deeply. Someone said to me this week, how is it that you don't seem to lose hope? Despite the setbacks in our city, despite the systemic issues that we never seem to get around to address in our world, despite the death all around, despite the weariness that COVID has wrought in our lives in the world, how is it that you don't seem to lose hope? Honestly, I had to think carefully about my answer to avoid some kind of imprecise language that might offer something about God that sounded glib or superficial or trite, something less than the truth. And what came to mind is actually watching people that I know or see in the world going deeper into their own callings, going deeper into their own responses to God's claim in their lives. It is observing so many volunteers raise a hand to say, I want to support Afghani refugees. It is watching so many of you give your lives toward healing and helping others in your work and with your volunteer time. It is noticing parents of young children attentively reorganizing your entire work and personal lives to make sure that you give your kids the love and attention they deserve at a time when the world is upside down. It is seeing you march and write and struggle for a fair world, and it is watching leaders inside and outside of the congregation bring your best selves into loving each other through so much loss, so much heartache and illness and hurt, the hardest parts of suffering in life. Acts of faith that always start out as words about love and grace and giving and healing and justice. It is God's love lived out, however imperfectly, in concrete acts of giving, organizing, and speaking that brings me deep hope. I hope for you this year it can bring the same.